Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our attendees joining us today for this latest Data Science Central webinar. This is Bill Voorhees, your host. I'm the Editorial Director with Data Science Central, and I'm also Chief Data Scientist for Data Magnum. I'd like to start off our event today by thanking Databricks for sponsoring today's event. Databricks is an integral supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we're honored to have them sponsoring our event today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Tableau, Alteryx, IBM, Tidalscale, Semantic Research, and Vertica, to name just a few. Now, past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com, and if you hadn't had the opportunity to view them, I encourage you to take a look. They provide some very useful insight into a wide variety of topics of interest to our data science community. So today's webinar is entitled, Apache Spark MLLib 2.x, Productionize Your Machine Learning Models. Now before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format of today's webinar. Today's event will be an hour long. Uh, we'll have one presenter that I'll introduce in just a minute. There'll be 10 or 15 minutes of QA following the presentation. And our event is being recorded and will be available on datasciencecentral.com later this afternoon following today's live event. I'd also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. So we'll be reviewing and presenting them on your behalf during the QA portion of today's event. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Richard Garris. Richard is a Principal Solutions Architect at Databricks, focused on helping clients with their advanced analytics initiatives using Apache Spark and MLLib. He's had 13 years working with enterprises in data management and analytics. Richard got his undergraduate degree at Ohio State University and a master's in software management from Carnegie Mellon. His previous work experience includes SkyTree, Google, and PricewaterhouseCoopers. So Richard, thanks for being with us. We're looking forward to your presentation. Now, Apache Spark has rapidly become a key tool for data scientists to explore, understand, and transform massive data sets and to build and train advanced learning models. The question then becomes, how do I deploy these models to a production environment? How do I embed what I've learned into customer-facing data applications? So in today's Data Science Center webinar, we'll discuss best practices on how customers productionize machine learning models, case studies uh, with actual customers, live tutorials of a few example architectures and codes in Python, Scala, Java, and SQL. So Richard, uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You can begin just as soon as you're ready to go. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you. Um, so welcome again to the webinar uh, on Apache Spark MLLib 2.x, how to productionize your machine learning models. A little about myself. Um, thank you, Bill, for the introduction. Uh, again, I'm a principal architect at Databricks. I've been at Databricks the last two years, and I've spent most of my career working in data. I work for PwC in the data management team, working at Google on some of the data initiatives at Google, as well as SkyTree, the machine learning company. And again, I'm an Ohio State alumni, as well as I have my master's degree from CMU. That's so a quick outline of what we're going to cover today. The first is an overview of Databricks. Um, the second will be a talk about Spark MLLib 2.x at a high level uh, for those that aren't familiar with the library. We'll talk a little about model serialization, which is the first step in actually um, productionizing your models to serialize it, to save it off to a format that can then be used in your production environments. We'll talk about the system requirements around model scoring, um, some different architecture options for model scoring, as well as the Databricks option for doing model scoring um, using uh, some of the things we've built in-house at our, at our company. A little about Databricks. Um, so again, Databricks was co-founded by the same uh, individuals at the AMP Lab that created uh, Apache Spark. Uh, so we started in 2013, and our vision as a company is to empower anyone to innovate faster with big data. Um, so our product is a platform built around Spark that gives data scientists, data engineers, and data analysts um, the ability to simplify their data integration, real-time experimentation, machine learning, and deployment of their production pipelines. Um, so again, as a key contributor to the Apache Spark project, we still contribute three-quarters of the code base to the open source code. That's 10 times more than any other company. Uh, so as a company, we're a commercial open source vendor 
Um, our goal is really to continue to be the stewards of Apache Spark, contribute to the community, um, but again, to have a product that we can uh, that we can help uh, other um, data scientists, you know, empower them to be very successful with the, their data initiatives. Um, so, if you think about um, things in terms of generation, so you all are familiar with the idea of first generation, second generation, third generation programming, um, starting with assembly and C, going up to like a Java, and then going up to a SQL. In a very similar vein, we have the generations of the of the analytics. So the first generation is really the, the data warehouse. The data warehouse is really designed around a rigid ETL process, uh, being able to scale out uh, usually appliances or very proprietary hardware and limit it to only SQL. So this is the generation of looking at Teradata, looking at, uh, let's say, uh, let's say or an Oracle data warehouse. Um, the whole idea was to be able to take all your data, centralize it in a star schema, and then be able to do queries against that data set. Um, so it's very expensive. It's very rigid. Um, it's very hard to adapt your data warehouse to new use cases. Um, for example, it could take up to two, two months from what I hear from my customers to add a simple column to your data warehouse just around all the processes required to make that happen. Um, so the second generation, which happened uh, five to ten years ago, is really the Hadoop or Data Lake. The whole idea was rather than using proprietary hardware, uh, was to use a you know, commodity hardware as well as um, a number of different servers to actually store all your data and maybe be able to get value out of it. Again, uh, one of the problems with this was you still have to centralize. You still have to move all your data sets from um, wherever your source systems are into the data lake, uh, as well as uh, use disparate tools, things like Pig, Hive, uh, Storm, Mahout for doing your machine learning. And it was very hard to actually do analysis in this environment because um, all these different tools were disjunct and hard to actually do all the analysis in this environment. Uh, so at Databricks and with, with Apache Spark, we look at the world slightly differently. We look at it as a world of virtual analytics. And what that means is rather than copying all your data sets into uh, one central location like a data lake, you can reference those sources from the various uh, locations where they, where they stand, whether it's in your data warehouse, in your data lake, or maybe in a storage layer like S3 or your Azure blob storage. You'll be able to take any sources that you have, regardless of where you store them, and be able to analyze them. So doing things like machine learning, do things like streaming, uh, real-time querying and, inter and interactive uh, analysis is all available to you using our virtual analytics platform, as well as enabling enterprise-wide collaboration. So having one environment that you can access all your data sets and work together to solve whatever uh, data problems you're trying to accomplish. Uh, so kind of drilling down into that view of the virtual analytics platform, uh, you have on your left your data sources. Uh, so again, um, you have S3, or you have your Azure blob storage, or whatever distributed file storage you have within the cloud. You have your, uh, data, your databases, either relational databases or could be NoSQL databases, as well as your HDFS. Regardless of your, where you store your data sets, you'd be able to reference those within the Databricks virtual analytics platform, and then do your analysis. So there's five key pillars that we built around the open source Apache Spark and Databricks to make it much easier to have inter inter enterprise grade analytics. So the first one is cluster tuning and management. Uh, so as the um, as our team you know is working on Spark, we're also advancing it in terms of performance. Uh, so we do a lot around making Spark very reliable, very fast, and works really well in the environments that we deploy into. The second piece is the interactive workspace. Um, so I'll show, show a little bit of this in a demonstration, but it'll show you how you can collaborate on your data science projects using a notebook. Uh, we also support uh, using third-party libraries in the same environment and be able to store and track all of the activities you do as a data science team. The, in the purple box on the left, you see the optimized data access. Uh, so the optimized data access is what we call DBIO. Uh, so it's the ability to more quickly analyze various sources of data. Uh, so there's a series of very fast connectors that give you the ability to um, access these data sources. We do predicate pushdown to limit the amount of data we pull out of these sources to make it more, uh, make it faster, uh, as well as we prune columns to make sure that, that uh, you only pull out the data you need from these various sources. Um, you have the production pipeline on the right in the orange box, and that's really about reliably running your jobs in a production sense, so either in a job schedule or maybe a streaming sense. Uh, we also have integration with third-party um, pipeline tools such as uh, Luigi uh, or Airflow. And that gives you the ability to actually take any work you've done in your experimental environments and be able to productionize that um, in a pipeline. Lastly, on the black on the bottom is our enterprise security. So enterprise security is the underpinnings of any uh, strong 
uh, data management platform. Um, so we have end-to-end -end encryption both on the wire as well as on disk. Uh, we provide um, we provide operational security, which includes permissions on each of the notebooks, permissions on the cluster, permissions on your data sets. So it gives you a lot of capabilities to protect your data um, and, and you only use it for legitimate business purposes. Um, so again, in, in the middle of this is the Apache Spark project. So uh, one of the key tenets of our platform compared to anything else is that we don't fork Spark. Um, so any code you write within Databricks is compatible with open source Spark. Um, so at any point that you wanted to either um, use two different environments that support Spark or or move away from Databricks if it's not the right fit for your team, then you have the ability to do so. Um, so there's no vendor lock-in like you have with some of the older uh, data warehousing type projects. Um, so that was it for, for Databricks. So I'm going to jump into Apache Spark MLlib. Um, so Apache Spark MLlib, again, is open source. Uh, it's community-driven both by Databricks as well as another, a number of other contributors. It started back in Spark 0 0.8 in the AMP Lab in 2014. Um, so today, we're, we're really working on a big project around migrating a lot of the functionality in the original MLlib, the 1.x 1 .x series, to uh, 2.x, which will be around data frames and on the concept of pipelines. Um, so again, it's about 75 orgs uh, contributing to the, to the project, as well as 250 individuals. The information is a bit dated. We probably have a few more contributors than that uh, as of today, but that kind of gives you a sense of how many companies are contributing to the project and how popular it, popular it is as a project for doing uh, machine learning at scale. Uh, so a couple of things, just at a high level so that you understand Amalib's goals. Uh, so it's meant to be a general purpose machine, learn machine learning library. And what I mean by that is that it's not designed for very specialized use cases. Um, things like, let's say, doing um, like uh, neuroimaging or processing or doing things like image processing in general, uh, things like doing TensorFlow for deep learning, it's not meant to be very specialized. Uh, so we cover a lot of the most common algorithms, things like uh, decision trees, uh, linear methods, um, random forest for ensemble methods, as well as many others that are kind of run the gamut of what's the most popular um, general machine learning algorithms. It's designed to be linearly scalable. So what that means is that if you double the size of your data and double the size of your machines, the runtime should be the, theoretically the same. Or if you keep the data size constant and you increase the machines by 2x, runtime is theoretically cut in half. Um, so it's not true of all machine learning libraries. Many have quadratic scaling um, problems where if you add a ton of data to them, they take very long to run. Um, so that's one of the goals of MLlib is really to be uh, linearly scalable. Um, so secondly, we're also fault tolerant. Um, so if any point a node uh, fails or an individual execution fails, we'll actually recompute um, after that failure. So if you're doing a very long runs, let's say it's a, a day or even a week, you know, you don't want to have a whole run fail because a single node fails. So we have built-in fault tolerance to prevent that type, that type of issue from occurring. Uh, we're built around the concept of data science pipelines, uh, very similar to scikit-learn. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how you build your end-to-end -end pipelines. Uh, we're entirely written in Apache Spark. And what that means is that any of the code we write is based on the Spark project. We don't have some type of custom fork around doing machine learning as separate from how Spark does its computations. And, and lastly, we really integrate well with your overall agile modeling process. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a high level. I know some of you are data scientists in the room, so it's very much a review. But just for, to get people up to speed, uh, the basic concept of a model is really a mathematical function. What that means is you have some type of input, you apply a function to that data, and you have some kind of output. Uh, the way machine learning works, it looks at historical data, looks at the previous history of whatever has happened for various events. It's using that information to train up a model or a function as representative of that data set. Uh, the simplest model is really linear regression. So if you, you know, obviously high school algebra, it's y equals mx plus b. Um, so one of the ways you can create a model is based on a linear function. Um, so it's a very common method, uh, linear regression or logistic regression for classification. Uh, other methods include things like decision trees. Uh, so decision trees are a nonlinear method. An example of that is on your left side of your box around, let's say, car mileage prediction. What this really is is learning a bunch of splits, given your data set. So things like looking at the weight of a car, if it's heavy, saying it's high mileage. If it's not heavy and the horsepower is less than 86, then it is high mileage. Those are a way of building another model which is nonlinear and then can maybe fit your data set a little bit better. Uh, but those are just two of the different uh, methods for doing machine learning, but there's many, many more. Um, even things as complex as deep learning or convolutional neural networks follow the exact same principle. Um, it's just a much more complicated function, but the principle remains the same. You have input, 
you have a function, you have your output. So if you ever read uh, any kind of literature on, on data science or machine learning, you'll see a very simple pipeline like, like you see on the left. Um, so you see that you have to load your data set, you have to extract some features, you train a model, and you do your evaluation. So a very simple example, um, but in the real world, it looks more like this. So you have a number of different data sources. It's very hard to find uh, the right data for your problem in, in, in most uh, large organizations. You have different data in different formats. It could be in, let's say, JSON. It could be in CSV. It could be in your databases. Um, so if you look at, the, at this, it's a very typical example of a pipeline in a real enterprise. So you have to do a bunch of feature extract transformations. Maybe you're doing some NLP, natural language processing, or doing some like TF-IDF if you have other types of text. And then you have to do um, training your, your models. Um, so you might need to do different models and different hyperparameters and train a bunch of different models to see which is the most rep representative. Or you might have to use a bunch of different models for different parts of your data sets and ensemble them together to actually get to the most accurate and predictive model. But this is what a real pipeline looks like. It's very complex and has a lot of different, uh, lot of different pieces to the overall model. Um, so one of the issues with um, data science and data engineering is there's a gap. So this gap is really um, kind of an historical. Um, data scientists have typically worked in very um, prototyping type environments that are very agile, things like Python R or maybe uh, SAS. And those environments don't necessarily translate well into data engineering or, or production um, which is typically done in Enterprise Java. Um, so what we see today is the most, one of the most common patterns um, in terms of how to productionize models is really uh, recoding. What that means is you take whatever has been developed in your prototyping environment, Python, R, or maybe SAS, and actually had to recode that in another language, typically Java. It could be your C or C++, um, but it's very problematic because it creates extra work. Uh, so you have different code paths um, for data engineering versus data science. Um, the methods you use data science are very agile, may not translate well when it goes to production. And, and most importantly, it's very slow to update your model. So in, in some organizations that have this type of um, uh, model deployment scenario, it could take up to six months to deploy new models, which is not a very good way to kind of have an adaptive, agile enterprise. Um, so within Spark MLlib 2.x, and this is part of our open source code base, is the concept of model serialization. So what this means is that regardless of using Python, R, or Scala, you can save off your model um, into a file storage layer. Typically, it's either S3 if you're using cloud, or HGFS if you're on-premise. And you'll be able to save off your model, and you'll be able to load it into your data engineering platform using a simple model.load command. This gives you a lot of flexibility to do your training however you choose to within the, within the language you want in, in Spark, and then be able to save it off in a way that can then be deployed into your production environments. Uh, so a couple of code snippets, and I'll go through some of this in more detail in a demonstration, but I want to give you some ideas of how this will work in actual code. Um, so if you look at the left, you see Scala. On the right, you see Python. Uh, so on the left side, we're training a model. Uh, we have an entire pipeline of various transformations, as well as your actual estimation. And you call fit on that pipe, and that produces the model object in memory. Um, within uh, Scala, you can say model.write.save pass it a directory, it'll save off that entire pipeline into that folder. Uh, Python is very similar, a little bit different syntax, but the same idea. You call fit on the data set, create your model and memory, and then be able to save it again to your directory of choice. Um, so one of the things I want to show you a little bit is how to introspect those models. So again, a model is a function. So if you look at a model and you do a simple ls, in this case, of that directory, you see that there's two directories. One is metadata which gives you some overall view of, of the actual parameters for that model, as well as the stages. Um, the stages will give you each of the different steps within the actual pipeline. Um, so I'm going to look at the, the simplest model, in my opinion, which is really a transformer. Uh, so transformer, again, is a preprocessing step. It's a featureization logic used before you actually train your whatever function you're trying to build with your estimator. In this case, I'm looking at a string indexer. A string indexer is a very simple transformation. All it does is it takes a series of strings. Um, turns, they're usually considered categorical, so if you're used to kind of traditional machine learning, and turns it into an integer. So in this case, I'm looking at a string indexer. You'll see here within the output that there is the actual class name, the time step when this was run, the version of Spark, a few parameters that were used for this particular transformation, and then you see the actual data. 
actual data itself is simply a hash map. It's just saying, okay, here is a series of values, private, self-employed, local government, and here's the integer that represents those values. So again, this is a function. It's simple. You put it in a string, it gives you an integer. Uh, but it's not doing anything complicated in terms of uh, in terms of an actual like complex function like let's say an ensemble tree method. Um, so looking at a little bit more of an actual estimator, an actual learner, this is what you look at when you see logistic regression. So again, if you look at the output on the right, you'll see here that this is the actual output from this training run. It's showing you these are the hyperparameters used, so the number of iterations, elastic net uh, for regularization, as well as the threshold, uh, whether you have an intercept or not. And the data itself, in, in kind of small print here on the right, on the bottom corner, is both the intercept as well as the coefficients. Um, so again, this regression is a very simple equation, and a model, again, is a function. So this gives you all the data on what the function was actually produced, given the actual uh, machine learning uh, training. Uh, so to give you another example of this is decision tree. So decision trees are a nonlinear method, and really it's a series of splits. So it's looking at a binary split across different parts of your data to figure out, okay, given this data, this is the decision tree that I want to use to apply to to, to learn from the previous data and then make uh, predictions on new observations. So again, I'm not showing you in this case the metadata. Um, it's going to look very similar to the previous slide, but the output itself will actually be a series of splits. So you'll see here on the left, you'll see the actual prediction, whether it's one or zero, yes or no, because it's a classification problem. Um, some statistics like impurity uh, is the information gain, and then the left and right uh, children. So this will give you the idea of what the decision tree actually would be um, in your environment. Um, it's a little hard to read this because it's actually a tabular format. Uh, within Databricks itself, we support uh, visualizing the same tree. So it gives you a much better view of how the, the model would actually work and actual introspect, you know, where are my splits, you know, what's my prediction, how, what's my tree depth at various parts of my, of my, um, of my actual model. And so it gives you all the ability to do some, some checking of your model before you would deploy it into production. Uh, if you are using uh, ensemble methods like random forest or granny boost and decision trees, very similar to the series of trees as opposed to a single decision tree. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little about the requirements that uh, I understand from my customers around how do I deploy a robust model deployment system and make it work at scale and production. Uh, so a few examples of model scoring environments. So they're very diverse. It's not a single environment that's used in model scoring. Uh, the most common that I hear of is really in web applications or e-commerce portals, very common in ad tech, as well as in uh, anything where you're trying to sell something. You know, a lot of recommendation engines where you're you know, showing, uh, let's say, on the sidebar, a couple of suggested products, um, things like ad targeting of here's an ad for an individual user based on previous data of, that I have of, of this particular uh, person. So it's a very common scenario, but it's not the only scenario. Um, so we see a lot of model scoring even in legacy systems like mainframe and batch processing. So this is very common in financial services where a lot of the key um, uh, core applications like uh, bank processing systems or payment systems are really mainframe. And so we even see model scoring in, in COBOL, for example. Uh, we see examples in real-time processing systems or middleware. Uh, a lot of examples of using APIs and microservices to really fit into your overall SOA architecture, uh, as well as embedding in devices. So things like being able to deploy a model on a mobile phone uh, within a medical device, or even in an automobile for things like self-driving cars or, or car automation. Um, so one of the key parts of machine learning is really more than the ML code itself. Um, so I was at Google uh, in 2011, and a few years you know, after I joined, this, a paper came out called uh, Hidden, Debt in in Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. Um, so one of my friends actually contributed to this paper, and the key tenet of this is that in real, the real world of, of Google in terms of machine learning, machine learning is a very small part of the overall system for how you would both deploy as well as create your models. So things like configuration, data collection, feature extraction, data verification, machine resource management, all these different big boxes are all things that surround the overall machine learning that are as critical, if not more critical, than machine learning itself. Um, so it's very complex and a very, um, a very hard system to maintain for the, for the average company. Um, so one of the key tenets of, of data science is really it's, it's a science. What that really means is very agile. So you have to be able to be able to set your business goals, understand your data, create a hypothesis you know, from the scientific method, devise some type of experiment to test your hypothesis, you prepare data, train, tune, test your model, deploy it, and then you measure and evaluate the results. 
Um, so again, this is very similar to Agile, Scrum, or other um, development processes you have at your company. Data science follows that same pathway. Uh, so the focus of the talk is really on deploying this, the model, but when many when people deploy models, they, they forget that their deployment should follow this exact same process because the Agile modeling process it doesn't, doesn't stop when you deploy that model. Uh, so deployment should be Agile. I mean, when you deploy your model the first time, it may not be the most accurate model. If you recall from many years ago when Netflix first launched uh, recommendations for their movies, their creations weren't very good. It took a long time for them to figure out you know, based on actual people clicking on various movies, what is the best uh, method, what is the best weights to use for any given individual to make sure that they're engaged in the next movie or next TV show they want to watch on the platform. Um, so when you develop your model and you spend, let's say, you know, the first few weeks or a few months developing that first model, you shouldn't stop um, being able to do agile testing of that model. So you deploy your model, you need to apply like, things like A-B testing, be able to experiment with different models in production to see which model performs better, um, you should be able to support doing uh, evaluations of the models and performance even when they're in production. So things like checking the accuracy, checking the AUC curves, even on models that have been de already deployed in production. And again, I, I mentioned this in the serialization part of the discussion, your deployment should also be fast and adapted to business needs, and you should be able to actually redeploy your models on a regular basis to make sure the model continues to be predictive and provides business value. Uh, so a little bit more about A-B testing and monitoring and updates. So A-B testing came from the concept of mailing. So people will experiment with different um, graphics or flyers for their mail. It's carried over into computer science and into uh, specifically data science. So it gives you the ability to actually do predictions uh, on different data. So a couple of ways to do A-B testing. One is called benchmarking or shadow models. That's the ability to actually have a model that's not in production, but still you want to measure what it would look like in production. Another concept is phase-in, meaning that you would take 20% of your traffic and use a new model and still use 80% of the traffic on an old model. And in general, I, I recommend avoiding Big Bang. Don't just take a model that's working in production and replace it with a new model unless you're really sure it's really going to work in your production sense. Um, so one other key point in terms of logging, and this is a little bit of a controversial uh, uh, topic, but any data you actually pass to your model, you just snapshot that so you know exactly what is passed into the model. I can't tell you how many times I work with a customer where they think the model is broken, it's not doing what it's supposed to, but really what happened was a user went into their account and changed their profile. Maybe they moved or they changed their general preferences, and that was what actually caused the change in the model. So making sure that you understand if it's a problem with the model or it's a problem with the change in the data is really important as you do your monitoring of, of these models in production. Uh, so a couple of different options in terms of considering the scoring environment. One is understanding your SLA, the response time, as well as your throughput, which is the number of predictions per second, and the overall uptime and reliability of the platform. You also need to look at your tech stack, whether you can see C++, legacy, like a mainframe system, or Java, and really understand those, those constraints as you think about deploying your models. Uh, so a couple of different options in terms of scoring. Obviously, there's batch, which is asynchronous. Um, it's used often in internal use if you're sharing your models internally within your analyst team. Uh, triggers can be event-based on time. Let's say you run it every night. It's often used uh, in, in many cases for email campaigns, notifications. It's also something you shouldn't shy away from. There's many cases where batch makes a ton of sense for how you do your scoring as opposed to doing something in real time. Uh, so again, real time is synchronous. Um, synchronous varies between things like seconds, meaning a customer's waiting, I call that human real time, or sub-second, things like high frequency trading or fraud detection on the swipe of a credit card. So a couple of things. A lot of people will jump from, okay, I'm doing machine learning, I want to do online learning. Um, so the first two concepts. One is I'm going to talk about open and closed loop. Uh, so open loop is having a human being involved, and closed loop is no human involved. Um, so whenever you do your model training, it's almost always open loop. You always, have, you always need a data scientist to evaluate the model, make sure it's doing what it's supposed to, make sure there's no bias in your model. So it's really important to do open loop for your training. A scoring is usually closed loop. It means that a person is usually not involved in the actual decision that goes back to the end customer. Uh, but in some cases, you may want to actually make it open loop, meaning that before you would send someone a, a fraud notice that their card has been stolen or there's another problem with their account, you may want to have an agent actually examine that and call that person individually and making sure that we have a little bit of a check before it goes directly to a customer to make sure you have the right customer service. Uh, so online learning is closed loop, so almost like this whole this whole Skynet um, kind of um, you know, fiction from, from Terminator. But in, in reality, like, there's very few cases where I've seen online learning work in practice. 
you know, we have issues like we saw last year with Microsoft with their chatbot that got biased into some racial disparities and other things based on what it was learning from, from the people that were using the system. So you have to be very careful when you do online learning. You have to have proper safeguards, making sure there's no, like, again, abuse or sensitivity to, to, new, to new data that's just noise in the system and not going to be predictive. So I'd highly recommend, uh, rather than doing online learning, which we do support in MLib through a few of our different methods, to use a more complex method that can better fit new data rather than jumping into online learning a a as a first pass. Uh, so a couple of different things so in terms of model scoring um, examples. So keep in mind that model scoring isn't always a yes or no answer. So a good example is a bot. So if you're trying to detect a bot on your web page, many times you're going to have kind of a, a series of maybes. So you might be, you know, about 40% sure this is not a bot, in which case you allow a person to log in. If you're about 40 to 60% sure that this person is a bot, but you're not 100% sure, you may want to send a challenge question to that person, saying, okay, what is your, your mother's maiden name, or what is your, you know, your best friend from high school's name? That way it kind of throws off a bot, but doesn't necessarily block a, a legitimate customer from using a web page. Um, there's other options as well as you get into higher probabilities that this is a bot, things like sending people an SMS text code, referring them to a call agent to unblock them, or if it's really, you're really sure it's a, it's a bot, you may just want to block them outright to prevent them from actually abusing whatever service you have on your web page. Um, so another output might be recommendations. So if you look at ALS as an example, you have model scoring. And what this gives you within the recommendation engine is the ability to actually give you a list of predictions of items you might recommend for a person. Uh, so again, if you go, let's say, to Amazon.com and you see a product, you might get a series of six other products that are recommended for you based on you know, whatever you previously viewed on Amazon. So this is an ex another example of how you get data um, out of your scoring system and be able to use that data to do your, your predictions. So I'm going to go through a few high-level scoring architectures. Um, so these are not all the end-all, be-all of ar all architectures within, um, within MLlib. But it does give you uh, some options in terms of understanding at a high level what are the options for how you would deploy your models in production. So the first example is really offline learning. So it's the ability to actually take a model, do your pre-computation of your predictions, and save it off to a database. So this is actually a very common scenario, in fact, one of the most common scenarios for recommendation engines. So in this example, we're training an ALS model, figuring out, like, here are the top products that a person may be interested in. You would send an email to that customer saying, here are like you know, three different items you might be interested in buying from us. You would say it was offers, let's say, a NoSQL database or let's say a Redis caching engine. And then whenever a person actually looks at that email or pulls it up on the mobile device, they'd be able to say, okay, here are the offers that you're going to have. You know, I highly recommend this option if the model you're using is very complex or if you don't have any contextual information coming into your system. People's general preferences for what they buy don't change every day. So in that case, it makes a ton of sense to save it to a data storage layer, and then whenever a person actually views that on their mobile device or on the web, it comes back instantaneously. You don't have the lag time of actually running a, a prediction function. Instead, you do just have the, the output of the, the pre-computation of the prediction. Uh, so again, you can do this in Spark. You can do it in Databricks using our job scheduler. You'd actually have a recurring batch job that runs maybe nightly that says, okay, here's the predictions for the next day or the next week, and then you'd be able to use that um, to actually deploy your models in a production sense. Uh, so option B is uh, what we call stream and score. Um, so this example is really talking about that bot detection scenario. Uh, so we have a, a bunch of activity coming in from log data, typically your web logs. You need to actually stream that into a system to compute features. You run whatever prediction function you've already saved off. You save that score into a caching layer. And you have an API on your website that actually checks periodically to say, okay, is this individual user session you know, valid or not valid? Um, so this is a very common scenario as well. I call it stream and score. Uh, the reason why this is important for this scenario is that if you look at web activity as an example, each individual activity within, the, within your log may not be very predictive. You may need a series of logs or a series of events from an individual that gives you a higher probability that this person is actually um, either a fraudster or someone trying to abuse your web page. So it's very important that you have a synchronous streaming job that actually can um, do those computations and save off that result and then have something periodically checking to see if this person is a legitimate user of your web page or not. Uh, so this is, again, another option in terms of how you would deploy things in architecture, using streaming as the kind of the core engine for how you would deploy that model. Uh, so option C, and this is what I see very, very commonly today with most machine learning, both inside of Spark and outside of Spark, 
And that's training something with Spark with other um, analytical systems and scoring outside of Spark. Um, so this would apply to cases where you need nanoseconds of latency or microseconds of latency. You train the model in Spark, save it off to S3 or HGFS. You copy the model to production, wherever your production system is, and then you would load that, that model file, uh, either the coefficients intercepts in the case of a linear regression or logistic regression file, or loading your splits um, from that file. And then when you actually do your predictions, you're actually just doing it against a function that you developed that says, here's some new data, and here's the actual prediction given that data set. This is a very common scenario and what I see most often in, in production. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Databricks model scoring. So everything you saw in the previous slides around serialization, some examples of doing scoring architectures can be done outside of Databricks. Uh, but I want to give you an option within Databricks to make it much easier to deploy your models in a production sense. Um, so this is really based on that last option you saw, option C. And the goal is to train your models with MLlib, but deploy outside of MLlib. Um, we want to make it very easy to embed in your existing environments, low latency and complexity, low overhead, um, and ability to actually deploy your models at scale. Um, so I'll go through some of this in our demonstration, so I might jump ahead a little bit on a couple of these slides. But the point of this is we created a library. We call it Databricks uh, a DBML Local, Databricks Model Scoring Local. What this is is a version of MLlib that doesn't use Spark. Instead of using Spark to do the actual, um, the actual predictions, it's actually using a, a third party or, or internal library to do that. Uh, so you can make predictions much faster than using the underlying uh, Spark engine to do your predictions. Uh, the code for this on the right side is very simple. You call fit on your data set, and you call model exporter.export, .export, and you save your model to a file. And then in another application, let's say in Java, you would actually be able to import that model and then call transform on that to actually do your scoring. Uh, so again, this is in private beta. It's available to Databricks customers using our professional edition of our platform. Um, it's available in Spark 2.1. Uh, right now, we're in private beta, so we only have a few methods available. So logistic regression was the most common ask from our customers. We're working on additional estimators and transformers today, things like random forest as well as vector assembler. Um, so those are going to be available shortly, so you can do your entire pipeline using the Databricks model scoring as an option for you. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I'm going to show you um, a quick uh, plug for our Spark Summit coming up next month, June 5th to 7th. Uh, again, sparksummit.org, uh, 2017. So please come to our conference. We have a number of different presenters on Spark and Spark on Spark community. Uh, so this is going to be able at Moscone Center this year. Um, so we're really excited about this, and you know we invite you all to attend. I'm going to jump into our demonstration, and then we're going to get into questions in a few more minutes. Okay, this is uh, Databricks. So Databricks is a, again, it's a web-based platform for running Apache Spark. In this case, you're looking at our integrated workspace. I'm actually using Databricks Community Edition, which is a free version of Databricks that any one of you can use. So if you're interested in learning about Spark, learning about data science, um, please come to databricks.com and look for the link to try Community Edition. We have a number of different examples for data scientists on how to get up to speed on Apache Spark. Uh, so for example, you click on this link, you'd actually open a page over here, which gives you kind of a tutorial on how to do uh, use uh, Spark for data science. Um, so you can look at that uh, on your own time after the webinar. Uh, so I'm going to jump into an example notebook that showed you the same code I showed you in the presentation. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at a simple adult data set from R. Um, again, this is census data. What we're trying to do in this case is predict, given an adult, like what is their income, given the various attributes of that person. Um, so I won't go through uh, all the data in detail. Um, I'll be able to show this, this notebook later. Um, and needless to say, that's a series of demographic data, so things like your ethnicity, uh, your gender, as well as education level. Um, and we're using all this data to, pre again, predict your income, whether it's more than 50K or less than 50K. Uh, within Databricks itself, um, you can do the same code you would do in open source Spark. So in this case, I'm doing a bunch of different steps to actually do my featureization logic using string indexers and one-hot encoders. Um, so in this case, I'm calling write.save. So let me scroll up a little bit here. I call fit on my data set. I'm training two different models in this case. So one is a logistic regression. And again, it's a classification problem. And the second one is a decision tree. So again, you call write.save to save off your model set models. You can do a simple ls of that directory to look at the different stages in the model. 
you can do a head, which is, is showing you is really a cat of this, of this file. What this is showing you, here's all the various steps in my pipeline that I just ran. And here's where I'm actually looking at the actual uh, models of themselves. So in this case, I'm going to look first look at my, uh, my string indexer model again. Uh, so again, the string indexer model contains a metadata folder which gives you some high-level um, textual data about, about the model run itself, um, so both the output column, input column, as well as, um, as well as the version of Spark that was used. The data folder itself is actually a Parquet file. So Parquet is a very common format for in Spark as well as in big data. Um, so you'll actually read that using a simple spark.read.parquet. Uh, and this is the actual um, data itself. So again, the data is simply a hash map. So it's showing you here's my various labels, and here are the string indexes for those labels. So I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit more, and I'm going to show you logistic regression as an example. So in this case, we're looking at our logistic regression model. So you can see here that this is the actual method name itself. These are the uh, various hyperparameters I use for this individual model. And this is the actual data set. This is my coefficient matrix. So these are all the coefficients that are used. Uh, so one of the nice things about uh, Databricks as opposed to open source Spark, you have this nice HTML table that you can use to actually look at these different values. And so I can see these are 100 different um, coefficients or weights given my variables. I'd be able to actually examine those in, in the Databricks notebook. Um, so the other model I did was a decision tree. Uh, so here I'm looking at a decision tree and I'm using that feature I, I mentioned before in Databricks to actually uh, draw the entire tree uh, as an as a actual graph. So I can see here, here's all the different splits and different features and the actual predictions here on my leaves at the bottom. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit more and look at the data uh, uh, for this same decision tree. So if you ever want to look at this in a tabular format, here is all my different splits. Again, here's my impurity information gain on each of the different splits, and this is the actual um, thresholds for those splits as well. So it gives you a complete transparency into what the model is doing. Um, you can use this data again to either recode the model or use the database model scoring option. Uh, so one of the nice features that um, you have, at both in Open Source Spark as well as in Databricks, is that any of these different data you create, in this case, the decision tree data, which is a tabular format, I can save it off to, let's say, a JSON using a simple one-line command. And then if I ever wanted to create something outside of Databricks to actually do my scoring, I can take this JSON file, import it into whatever system I'm using, and then run the, run the uh, series of splits using a simple um, recursive uh, function of some type. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little bit into like how we can do model scoring in Databricks using our model scoring uh, system. Um, so, this is a professional feature. You have to have the full platform version. I'm showing you this in Community Edition, but you'd have to do this in the full platform version. So if you're interested in that, um, please talk to sales at Um So the first step to do that would be import the model export library. Um, again, this is the only support model we have, which is logistic regression. We're going to support a number of different models uh, in the future. It's very much the same as what you saw previously, which is be able to ex export your model using a simple one-line command. Here's a full I want to export it to. And these are the files I've exported. So one is the data, which is the actual model itself, as well as some metadata about that same model. Um, so this library that, that's been used to actually do the scoring is available on Bintray. Um, so I can give you a link to that later. This is the actual library that you would be able to import into whatever your IDE is to your model scoring. So I'm going to bring up my IDE now. I'll give it a minute for, for it to come up on your screen. Uh, so again, this is the data and this is the metadata about that model. So here is the, uh, the label, the features, the, the weights, or, as well as the indices for those weights. And to do actual scoring, it's very simple. All you would do is uh, load the jar. This is about a 45 megabyte uh, jar that's being used uh, for this particular um, scoring library that you can download on your own from Bentray. Um, you would load the file um, that's used for, that you've exported from Databricks uh, into your own environment and then you would simply call uh, app.predict. I'm going to run this. And here's the actual prediction. So given the, this, this feature I provided, this is the input I used, um, this is the actual prediction. It's actually a yes, this person has over 50K of income, and the prediction time was under 0 0.02 seconds. So it's very, very fast. So this gives you the ability to take any model that's created in Databricks and score it in near real time 
whatever system you're doing uh, in your environment. Okay. Well, thank you for joining our webinar. We're going to get into uh, our question and answer section. Uh, so let me uh, go back to the main page. And so Bill will be leading our uh, question and answer section, and we will uh, be able to take any questions you, might, you guys might have. Okay, Richard, hey, thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, and uh, we'll get started today with today's Q&A session, and I want to thank the audience for their participation. We've had a lot of questions that have come in, uh, and we'll do our best to get through them all during this time remaining. So during this Q&A session, I'll leave up this screen with contact information for Richard if you'd like to contact him following today's uh, event. So let's get started. Uh, Richard, you know, the, uh, can you give us an example of, of uh, where a customer needed to train a model on Apache Spark but deploy it on an external system? Is that a, a really a common problem? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's just two recent examples. Um, one is a, a major bank that I've worked with in the past. They would train their models with Apache Spark or uh, using PySpark specifically, but they wanted to deploy that into a mainframe system. And so in that case, they used, uh, they trained the model and used, in this case, COBOL to actually do the, um, the scoring. I've also had scenarios where I worked with a company that did um, car automation. And so the model they developed in Datarix would have to actually be deployed on the car itself. And so they actually had to recode that model to work uh, with the car's hardware. And so that's a, really a reco recoding scenario. So it's very common. Um, it's both happens both in Apache Spark as well as in other systems for doing machine learning like, app, like SAS, SPSS. Um, there's a lot of um, options where the, this, this, uh, this, this scenario occurs. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for that answer. Now, it, what's the difference between uh, Apache Spark ML Lib 2X and Spark's ML? That's a great question. So uh, in the very part, first part of the presentation around uh, talking about Spark ML Lib, the spark.ml lib library is um, based on RUDs. The spark.ml library, uh, which is a package name, is going to be based on data frames and the concept of pipelines. That's really the only difference. We're going to slowly deprecate some of the, um, uh, the, the spark.ml lib methods as we go into spark, I'll say, 3.0. Um, but for the most part, they're going to be supported over the, over the longer term. Um, but again, so one of the key tenets is that MLlib is still the name of the project. We haven't changed the project name to Spark ML. A lot of that's been talked about in the community. The project is still called Spark MLlib. Oh, terrific. Oh, thank you for that clarification. Now, uh, audience question. Uh, you know, what is the best way to test pipeline data? Uh, how do we know uh, when our uh, production models are starting to drift and are no longer accurate? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what I typically see on, on I would say, state-of-the-art organizations is, is every time a, a scoring prediction comes out is you actually save off the result. Um, that gives you the ability to actually say at any given point in time, historically, well, what's going on with this model? And then you would have dashboards as well as uh, learning in place within your system to actually detect whenever the model is starting to drift, whenever it is either your AUC is going down or your accuracy is going down or if you're using some kind of weighted metric, that metric is, is not what you want it to be. And you'll be able to actually do, let's say, alerting to uh, your data science team to say this model needs to be upgraded, otherwise you're, you run the risk of having lost revenue or lost opportunities. Okay, well thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, when you were giving your demo, uh, the latter part uh, appeared to be on the uh, Databricks platform. The, uh, the audience was a little confused about the notebook you showed first. What, what is that notebook that you were working from at the beginning of your uh, demo? Uh, yeah, so this is Databricks Notebooks. So this is what we call our integrated workspace. Um, so it's very much like a Google Docs uh, for data. Uh, so it's not a proprietary notebook, or sorry, open source notebook like Zeppelin or, um, or Jupyter. Um, it is proprietary to Databricks. It's part of our, our software as a service platform. Uh, but it's also compatible with like IPython notebooks or HTML. So it's not meant to lock you in, but it's meant to give you the best possible experience to run Spark as a data scientist. Okay, good. Yeah, notebooks are always a, a good thing. Um, you know, some specific questions about uh, what you support. Uh, one of our audience members asks, uh, do you support H2O to work with uh, Spark? Uh, and is that a basic part of your Databricks license? 
Um, so H2O is an open source project. We support H2O in Databricks. Um, so I, I help customers uh, work with H2O um, actually on a fairly regular basis. I'm one of the partner engineers that works with that team. Um, so you can definitely use H2O uh, to train your models after you've done your futurization in Spark and to save off that, save off that model uh, using H2O to save logic as well. Um, so it's not part of, quote, unquote, the Databricks license. You know, H2O is open source. Uh, so we can provide support up until the point of um, something that's key to H2O, in which case you have to ask either H2O, H2O for support or use H2O's forums. So we're not experts on H2O, but we can help you at least integrate it within the Databricks platform. Okay, good. Thanks. And uh, similarly, uh, we have a uh, an audience member <clears throat> who's using a Cassandra cluster for storage um, and wondering if we can store Spark models in, in their uh, Cassandra cluster, for example, if they had even a model for every customer. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's actually a fairly common scenario. So uh, within Databricks, if you save off your model into that file, you can actually, you know, one line of code, save it back to Cassandra. Um, let's say you're doing a simple linear regression per customer. You can save off those coefficients and intercept for each customer, save it off to Cassandra, and then at any point in time, if you wanted to score an individual customer, you just get the data and just run that, run that function. So that's a very common scenario. Okay, good. Thank you. Now, uh, audience wants to know, is Spark R a good option uh, to productionize Spark models? I would say Spark R is very good for training. Uh, for productionizing, I would lean more towards Scala or Java for a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one is type safety, and number two is the ability of other tooling around Java uh, for deploying things in production, things like CI, CD pipelines, continuous integration pipelines, as well as uh, the whole web server and APIs are mostly Java-based. So I wouldn't use Spark R for, for actual scoring. I would use Spark R instead for doing the training. Once you save the model in Spark R, you'd be able to actually productionize it in Java uh, pretty easily. So I wouldn't, wouldn't use Spark R necessarily for production. Right, right. And uh, audience also asks, you know, how different is Spark model serialization different from the uh, portable format for analytics, PFA? Uh, PFA, you mean PML? Well, this um, audience member has used the phrase PFA, portable format for analytics. I'm not familiar with that either. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that either. I, I, I'll talk to PML because I'm familiar with that. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it is a different format. PML is more like an exportable format, almost like PDF is to, like, let's say, a Word doc. So it doesn't support absolutely everything. Um, mostly supports mostly estimators, not necessarily all the transformers. That's why when we created a serialization format, we did something standard, uh, in this case, either Parquet or JSON, uh, that you can then read and interpret, and it's very um, transparent, but not necessarily PML. Uh, we would, you know, welcome, you know, a community contribution if you wanted to translate some of this information to PML, uh, but it's not something that we have right now in the Spark uh, ML package. Uh, we do have in Spark ML Lib for a number of different models um, as an exportable, exportable format if you choose to use PML. Okay, maybe you go a little bit further on that. For example, what, what's the motivation for developing a proprietary real-time scoring model uh, when most models in ML Lib already support PMML? Yeah, so it was mainly uh, the, the, that PML didn't support everything that's available that we do within MLlib. A good example of this is that some of our transformers, let's say uh, a TF-IDF transformation for text, isn't well supported in PML. So that's why we, we, we looked at how to serialize. You want something that's open, in this case, like either a JSON or, um, or a Parquet that people can then import and read however they want to, and not necessarily support PML because it doesn't support everything we needed to from a, a, a savable, serializable format. Terrific, terrific. And, and the audience questions continue to come in, and they're very specific. So I'm just going to uh, kind of read these off to you and hope that you can respond at this level of detail. Um, can ML Live support PySpark? Uh, absolutely. So we support PySpark uh, or Python based as well as uh, Spark R, um, which is part of the kind of the R suite, uh, as well as doing Scala or Java. So those are all the languages we support within, within the ML Live uh, framework. Okay. Then, um, similarly, uh, what are the major differences between Spark 1.6x and Spark 2.x uh, with respect to machine learning? 
Um, so for the most part, like we haven't added, added a ton more methods. It's mainly that translation again from doing MLib, which is RDD based, which is very low level, a lot of boilerplate code, to using ML pipelines, which are much more robust and gives you a lot more capabilities around exchanging different methods as well as exchanging different transformers in your in your complicated pipelines. So that's really the main difference. Um, we just released Spark 2.2, uh, and one of the key uh, additions to that is the ability to do ALS which is part of recommendation engines, uh, in using data frames as opposed to using the MLlib uh, package, which would have to do with REDs. So that's, we're, we're slowly blowing that out, and by the end of the 2.x series, toward 3.0, we'll have all of our methods that are available at MLlib translated to uh, spark.ml. Okay, and, and you talked about uh, the DBML local. Uh, are all the Spark MLlib models available in your DBML local? Uh, not yet. We, we intend to have that um, supported uh, in, the near, in the near term, but not, not yet. Okay, terrific. Thank you for that, that uh, clarification. Now, um, an audience member asks about pipelines. Uh, did you implement a new pipeline library over Spark? Uh, this audience member has been using Spark pipelines and thinks they need to be improved a lot. <laughs> Oh, well, we, we appreciate the feedback. Um, so if, if you're a member of Databricks um, or a member of the Databricks community, meaning one of our customers, you know, we welcome that feedback um, from our product management team. If you're a part of the open source community and you have feedback, uh, we have a feedback page, feedback at databricks.com, um, which is part of our commercial company, or go to the open source Apache Jira and you know file feedback there uh, around you know, Spark ML pipelines and, and what can be improved there. Um, so we're all looking for feedback. Uh, in general, like, we, we see a ton of our customers within Databricks as well as open source using pipelines very effectively. Uh, so it would be great to understand like, kind of what the, that feedback is um, and see what we can do to make, make it better for you. Yeah, terrific. Thank you very much. And, and uh, I know we're all concerned that this stuff works absolutely as easily as possible. Um, audience member asks, uh, how easy is it for a data scientist with our skills to come up to speed on Spark skills? That's a great question. Um, so uh, as, as a member of Databricks, we train over 40,000 professionals every year on Spark. Um, so we have uh, trainers that go out and do training both at our Spark summits as well as our Spark live events. Uh, we do um, private training for, for companies. Uh, all of our trainings are also available online. So if you sign up for Databricks Community Edition and click on that first link, all of our lectures um, for data scientists are available there. Um, so it's pretty... Um, you know, easy to get started. You know, a little harder to get to get mastery of how to do distributed computation, distributed machine learning. Um, but the first thing to do is just start. See what see what's uh, what, see what works for you. And we have many different methods available to to get up to speed on Spark and be able to use that in your um, in your daily you know data science uh, activities. Okay, just so that I'm really clear on this, is is that specifically documentation that I could, for example, download on my laptop? And can I get a uh, a laptop version? Of Databricks to play with? Not a laptop version. It's it's web based. So if you go to community.databricks.com, uh, cloud.databricks.com, you'd be able to do Spark on uh, a small six gigabit six gigabyte mini cluster. We also have a number of tutorials on how to do Spark in that environment, but it's not necessarily downloadable onto your laptop. You'd have to do it on, on a web browser. Well, that's practically just as good, isn't it? Well, Richard, yeah. thank you. Some great answers to some very good questions. And for those of you that asked questions that weren't answered today, we'll be sending all the unanswered questions to Richard and the Databricks team so they can follow up with you after today's webinar. You know, I have just a, a few quick announcements. Uh, if you'd please mark your calendars for May 18th, and that's our next DSC webinar, which is DataViz, Death to Flat Dashboards by TIBCO. Uh, also, remember that today's taping will be available for on-demand viewing later today, and you can find that on the home page of Data Science Central in the webinar tab located at the top of the page. Well, this brings today's webinar to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance and thoughtful questions, and a special thanks again to Databricks for their sponsorship, and our speaker today, Richard Garris, for his insight into today's topic. My name is Bill Voorhees. I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event. I look forward to seeing you all again on May 18th. Have a great day. <laughs>